Caleb Houston, everybody around here has looked at the bird and it looks real good. Roger, roger. And uh, you're being awaited by the USS Ticonderoga. And uh, we're waiting to see you back here in Houston, too. All righty. You can relay to the Tyco. We've got their Fox Corpin and our hook is down. Roger that. This was Skylab on the final day of the first manned mission. And if you got the crew had this to, uh, last view the as they made preparations area, for return to uh, Earth. Give it, to you here. it had been a successful uh, mission. Uh, the large majority of scientific it's objectives it's were accomplished. But the bright orange sunshade, uh, the single solar wing, presented a striking reminder of a mission that was something more than routine. A mission that gave new meaning to the term manned spaceflight. Uh, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. We have ignition sequence has started. 6, 5, 4, 3, 1973, when the unmanned Skylab Saturn workshop was hurled aloft at Cape Kennedy, on the way to its assigned orbit 236 nautical miles in space. The cloud cover was heavy on launch day and prevented tracking cameras from seeing an event that occurred about one minute into the mission. At the point of maximum vibration, telemetry sensed premature deployment of the meteoroid shield followed by a weak electrical signal from the workshop solar array. Clearly, there had been a problem, but the exact nature wasn't known until after orbital insertion. During the first revolution, Skylab temperatures began to rise rapidly, and pieces of the puzzle started to fall in place. NASA engineers surmised that the anomalies were most likely related. It was felt that the meteoroid shield had been completely lost at deployment, which accounted for the high heat levels. Also, that fragments of the meteoroid shield had jammed or otherwise hindered full deployment of the solar array panels. Failure of these panels, which were designed to furnish about half of Skylab's electrical power, meant that the total power burden would have to be borne by solar panels of the Apollo telescope mount. By early evening, workshop temperatures had risen above the level of safety. Launching of the crew the following day received an indefinite hold, pending satisfactory solution. Flight support and engineering teams were immediately set in motion to find the answers. At stake was the future of the entire Skylab program. The most urgent need was to achieve a thermal electrical balance. This meant maneuvering to an optimum flight attitude for solar requirements that were in direct conflict. Too much solar radiation would drive temperatures higher, increasing the chances of component damage and food spoilage. On the other hand, generation of electrical power to drive heat exchanges and food freezers was wholly dependent on exposure to the sun. While flight controllers struggled to achieve this delicate balance, other teams had the major objective of designing a thermal shield that could be deployed on the workshop to make it habitable. NASA centers and private industry responded with a variety of shield concepts. The most promising designs were released for fabrication. Finally, they were subjected to functional testing. By the fifth day of the mission, the choice had been narrowed to a model called the Parasol. It had good functional reliability, and the crew would be able to deploy it from inside the workshop through a scientific airlock. Another shield, the twin pole sunshade, would also be carried on the mission as a backup. Here in the Skylab underwater simulator at the Marshall Space Flight Center, 
Crews practice extravehicular installation of the sunshade in conditions approximating zero G. As for the solar wings, simulation methods were mostly inconclusive. Little was known about the extent of wing damage at this point, and the crew could only speculate on how best to make them deploy. At mission control, solar orientation of the spacecraft had begun to yield positive results. Temperatures, still too high for habitation, were stabilized, and electrical power was sufficient for operating vital systems and equipment. Though still precarious, the situation had been checked. There was reason to believe it would remain stable until the astronauts launched, now scheduled for May 25th, 10 days behind the original schedule. On the day before launch, the parasol team raced the clock to deliver the flight article on time. They were down to the last 30-minute extension as the parasol, packed in the flight canister, was loaded for transfer to Cape Kennedy. In spite of the rigid schedule, hopes ran high that the parasol would do the job. Attention now turned to the astronauts who would attempt to put it in place. In the early morning hours of May 25th, Sky Lab 2, with both thermal shields stowed aboard, was well along in the countdown. The crew, meanwhile, made ready to embark on their historic mission. This all-Navy crew consisted of Captain Charles P. Conrad, Skylab commander, a veteran of both the Gemini and Apollo program. Commander Paul White, who would be Skylab pilot for the mission, had been a member of the support crew of Apollo 12. And Commander Joseph Kerwin, scientist pilot, who would be the first American physician in space. The 10-day delay had been a giant cram course for all concerned, especially for the crew. And their job was only partially complete. The execution of all the planning effort was now solely in their hands. Following a smooth launch, Skylab 2 maneuvered to the proper flight path attitude for its initial downrange orbit. By mid-afternoon, the crew had overtaken the workshop. TV picture beginning to come in now to the control center. Skylab Houston, we're AOS at Guam for the next 10 minutes. Sally, oh, the Skylab. We got her in daylight at 1.5 miles, 29 feet per second. Roger, Pete, copy. They effected rendezvous and performed a fly-around to assess the damage. Most predictions were confirmed. Hey, Houston, the meteoroid shield area is solid gold. Roger, copy. His brief description is his suspected solar wing... One and two, right? No, two right. is gone. Completely off the bird. Solar wing one is in fact partially deployed in the reason that you've got different readings not symmetric between your three solar panels is there's a bulge of meteorite shield underneath it in the middle and it looks to be holding it down i roger copy okay is that it looks like the meteorite shield at the upper vent panel on the sand wing has wrapped around it just slightly where are we now my guess is that our easiest thing to do is just go to the end and try and deploy it. Roger, uh, Pete, which, from which side of the stairs is the meteoroid shield slightly wrapped around? Is it on the side of the main tunnel? Or Before docking, the, uh, the crew attempted to free the wing. The other side, Jack. Although the try was unsuccessful, the TV pictures seen here proved invaluable in devising the technique that ultimately worked. 
Following a night's sleep in the command module, the crew spent the morning of Saturday, the 26th, activating and checking systems in the multiple docking adapter and airlock module. Later, they were given a go to enter the workshop. So we are progressing slow but sure, and everything so far is working. By late afternoon, the canister was positioned in the scientific airlock, ready for parasol extension. Okay, Pete, uh, we had a little drop out there, some noise. Uh, could you tell us what step you're on? We're about to put Rod Delta on. Roger, copy. Okay, we had no trouble venting it down. It vented in about four minutes, and it uh, held zero for ten minutes without any outcasting. The door opened very smoothly, and so far the ride extension has gone very easily, and as I say, we're just taking a little heat break. Some four hours after the operation began, the thermal parasol was deployed. It was then placed in position close to the workshop skin. Well, we don't think so, Houston. We can see the ends of all the rods. It's, it's completely free of anything. There's nothing hanging it up. It took about two revolutions of Skylab before temperatures began to fall. Projections showed that if the present trend continued, the workshop would be below 100 degrees the following day. It wouldn't be the most comfortable environment, but after a discussion with the crew, the decision was made to proceed the next morning with the normal flight plan. The crew put in a long trying day activating the workshop. Getting things organized and in the proper place was a chore in itself. However, they were discovering to their satisfaction that moving big pieces of gear presented no problem in the weightless environment. By noon, Monday the 28th, with the workshop completely activated, primary emphasis was on getting the biomedical experiment started. This was the first in a series of lower body negative pressure and vector cardiogram experiments. Paul White, the subject, Joe Kerwin, the observer. There followed a workout on the bicycle ergometer to check metabolic effectiveness and to evaluate the bicycle as an exerciser for long-duration missions. Ideally, the handlebars would be longer than they are now and would kind of sweep down around you so you could grab them in the right place. Other medical experiments conducted over the next few days included blood sampling from each crew member to satisfy the five blood study experiments body mass measurement to determine each crewman's daily weight and to validate the use of this device for weighing in zero G. A rotating litter chair, a part of the human vestibular function experiment, tested for motion sickness, rotation perception, and ability to determine orientation. In addition to these and other medical experiments, science experiments were simultaneously being performed. Here, Pete Conrad operates the Apollo Telescope Mount Control and Display Panel in preparation for the solar physics study. In subsequent operations, data such as this active region of the sun was recorded by the telescope. The Earth Resources Experiment also got underway after activation of the six remote sensing systems. Mark, F-192, I got a ready light. We just came out from over the clouds. How about that? Auto sequence start on 90, and uh, you need to go. From a broad field of view provided by this large space platform, the systems began photographing selected portions of the Earth's surface in the visible and near-infrared spectral regions. Although the crew had earlier encountered a number of equipment problems, the result of excessive temperatures, the prospect now looked bright for a full 28-day mission. The temperature had stabilized in the mid-70s. The food was good, and so was morale. And up to now, the 4,700 watts of available power appeared to be adequate as long as high-load experiments were staggered. However, by the fifth day, 
some of the storage batteries had begun to perform in a degraded manner. The power shortage grew critical, and it became apparent that to carry out the mission, the jam solar panel would have to be deployed. Meanwhile, at Marshall, in the underwater simulators, techniques were being developed based on TV coverage of the solar wing. Using only tools and equipment like those aboard Skylab, the backup crew developed a set of procedures they felt would do the job. On June 7th, astronauts Conrad and Kerwin made their exit to put the plan into operation. Just take your time. Okay, Houston, we're out there. We, uh, we have the debris in sight. There looks like enough room to get the cutter. And uh, I'm trying to help Joe stabilize. As the simulations had shown, right, access to the solar wing was the big problem, what with few handholds or foot restraints. It was solved by joining pole sections of the twin pole sunshade, anchoring it by hooking a pair of cutters onto the strap that held the wing. Thus, a temporary handrail was fashioned that allowed Pete Conrad access to the solar wing, where he attached a tether. The cutters then severed the strap and the tether was pulled taut to free the wing actuator. After the crew returned to Skylab, an attitude change placed the solar array system into the sun, where after a period of warming the hydraulic dampers, the panel arrays fully deployed. Within hours, the electrical power surged to almost double the previous level. It meant that the power management scheme could be abandoned and the original flight plan could be resumed. In the days that followed, the nagging problems that had plagued the astronauts from the start began to resolve. The mission began to sound much more routine, more like a normal working day. Experiments were coming off like clockwork, and a wealth of scientific data was being gathered. Experiments such as this one in materials processing. With more leisure, it was not uncommon for the men of Skylab to indulge themselves in the fluidity of movement in zero G. weightless condition also simplified sleep accommodations. Since there was really no up or down, the only requirement was a sleeping bag type of restraint. And as mentioned earlier, heavy objects were easily handled. It was the small pieces that sometimes got away. But even when objects were lost, they generally turned up sooner or later on the air conditioning screen, there to be reclaimed. On day 29, after performing final closeout of the orbital workshop, the crew donned spacesuits for the return leg of their mission. Skylab Houston, we're in that hold CMG. You're go for undocking. Okay, stand by. Roger. Okay, we're free. We got four tenths of a foot per second, Houston. Roger. Bye-bye, Skylab. After undocking, they remained on station briefly to obtain photographic coverage. Following deorbit, the command module, its heat shield trailing a fiery plume, re-entered the atmosphere. 
For the first time in about a month, the crew experienced the forces of gravity. Ticonderoga standing by for sonic boom now. Skylab Houston, through a row one. How do you read? Actually, we're leaving that clear Houston, and we think it's okay. We're out of 40,000. Very good, Pete. You're in the groove. Hello, recovery. Hello, recovery. Skylab on the main, and everything's okay. And this is recovery. Uh, we have a visual below the overcast about uh, 100 at uh, 050, 6,000. Flashdown occurred some 700 miles off Southern California, near the recovery ship, the USS Ticonderoga. After retrieval and positioning on the flight deck, the command module hatch was opened. One by one, the crewmen stepped forth unassisted, seemingly undaunted by their return to normal gravity. They accommodated to normal activity within several hours. In San Diego, the first Skylab crewmen were received by a vocal and appreciative throng. They had reason to be proud. The large majority of scheduled experimental data was gathered, and all subsystem operational test objectives were achieved. All this in spite of the problems encountered from the start. Problems that in the final analysis required the presence of man to reason, to decide, to execute solutions as only he can. <laughs> 